Hey, what's going on? In this interview, I talked to Chris Pearson of DIY Themes. DIY Themes is the creator of the thesis theme, which you can now get in the form of the focus theme. So I'll put links and stuff for that in the description so you can check it out. I'm not an affiliate, um, but I just like the theme and I like the stuff that Chris is talking about. Now, it was awesome to chat with Chris because I, I mean, I don't know him personally. I just send him an email and I'm a user of the theme. He was kind enough to do the interview with me. As we were peeling back the layers of the onion of Chris's story there, I was learning a whole lot. I had no idea how um, important you know Chris's work was for the early part of the you know premium themes area for WordPress. So that was really cool to take a look at that. Also, Chris is uh, very outspoken. He has uh, specific opinions on specific things, and whether you agree or not is, uh, you know, I don't really care if you do, but you can't argue with the conviction that he has and the sort of belief that he has in what he's doing. He's uh, very passionate about, you know, web design and where the internet is going and where the web is going and what themes need to do and maybe what they don't need to do. I can ramble on and on for a very long time, but I'll just say that I believe in the next you know, few years, I think we're probably going to see uh, more of a minimalist type of approach to themes versus the huge page builders that are slow to use, um, they're clunky, they make slow websites, and if a lot of people are you know, consuming content on a phone or a tablet or something like that, they don't really care about all these flashy sort of, uh, you know, formatting things that you can do. No, no one really cares about that stuff. They're just trying to get some information. So thanks a lot, Chris, for chatting with me, and I will send it over to the interview now. What's up? Doug Cunnington here. I'm with Chris Pearson of DIY Themes. Welcome, Chris. Yo, good to be here. It is a pleasure to talk to you. We were just chatting right before I hit record, and I've been a fan of Thesis and DIY Themes for years. I've been using it since the beginning, so thanks for putting out a good product. Hey, you're welcome. So thanks for, for using it. <laughs> so for the people that don't know you, can you give us an intro, a little bit about your background, and maybe a little about DIY Themes? All right, so... Uh... Uh, a short version is kind of tough to do. I guess I guess people would think of me as a as a coder, I'm a software developer, software engineer. Uh, I got my start, uh, at least in this version of my life. I uh, got my start with WordPress back in 2005 as a designer, and at the time that was sort of like the kind of like the early version, like the early growth of blogging. Okay, yeah. so there was a lot of demand for design. It was kind of a wild, wild west sort of landscape, and uh, just just all this demand. There was all this people wanted to take action. Nobody really knew how. I knew how to put the pieces together, and so I had you know kind of was able to build my profile during that time when there was uh, a, just a demand for anyone who was thirsty like me to kind of learn how to do this stuff. And um, going you know at starting as a designer. You know, you're always delivering pretty pictures to people, mm -hmm. essentially. You're, you're delivering stuff that makes people happy. You say, ah, oh, this is a look I like. And it, it was that sort of uh, value exchange that defined my, my early work. And pretty soon I realized that that stuff didn't go that far. You know, you, just, you satisfy one client, but then 50 people who view the site don't really care for it. Um, you realize that you've only delivered something for one person. And that that may not have any extended use beyond that. There may not be any other application for what you've built. And therefore, so like looking at it through that lens, I started to kind of feel like everything I had done was sort of worthless. Even right. if the, the person liked it or I got paid, like I didn't really care about that. I cared about the larger implication of the value exchange, which I felt like was lacking. Got it. And so that, that kind of got me through design work. I started dealing with WordPress themes. And then sort of having this realization that design was, was essentially worthless. I mean, it really pretty much is uh, to some extent. Custom design is largely worthless. And uh, this will be a theme that we'll touch on a little bit later, I think. But um, so I started using the mechanics of themes to deliver more longstanding value. Got it. And that has 
that I'm still on that path. Right. Today. So you got started in about 2005 and, and for the, actually for the ignorant people like myself, when did WordPress like roll out when like the first iterations of the, the what the fork? Is Early that, is WordPress that was really like 2003. Okay. Um, until, I'll say until early 2006, like January of 2006, movable type was actually the number one blogging platform. All the big, big bloggers at the time used movable type. Uh, and then there uh, became an awareness through this, this demand for customization and whatnot. Uh, you know, there was a demand for this customization. Movable type was very clunky. And so WordPress was a little bit easier to customize at the time. But the thing that really tipped it in favor of WordPress, because movable type was paid, it was like 99 bucks, but WordPress was free. So you'd think WordPress would have been a leader. That was not the case. Uh, movable type was a leader because all the players were using it. Well, what happened is there became this, uh, this SEO event horizon. People started to realize they needed to modify their HTML markup to be standards compliant, and Google would reward these sites. So it became like a gold rush to deliver HTML with, with SEO-enhanced SEO HTML. This was almost impossible to do with movable type. It was way more expensive to do with movable type. And WordPress made that much easier. There was a lot less friction on that pathway. And that really is what was the death knell for movable type and what you know launched WordPress into the popularity we see now. Got it. Interesting, interesting. And then from your designer days, so you were doing like custom design for folks and then you were like, this is not scalable in a way that is helping people and stuff like that. And that's yeah, how you the, got the impact things. wasn't good enough. You know, once the work was done, it was an artifact. It was essentially already dead. I hated that. Gotcha. And you could really, probably couldn't really reuse it because it was proprietary to sure. whoever. Sure. Just limited application, always working in this very idiosyncratic space. That's not really how we solve problems at any, <laughs> any type of scale. Not for an engineer, right? You're Definitely like, what not. What am I doing? I have so, an engineering degree. It's not in software, but it should have been. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say, what what is your education background? Uh, well, my specific college degree yeah. is in mechanical engineering, but I actually think my education background is more rooted in in, in my high school, which oh, was yeah. more competitive and and probably significantly better than any college was ever going to be. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, which, that's why uh, I learned computer science was in high school classes, and. Uh, that was sort of latent knowledge that I had, yeah. even working with WordPress, and I sort of uh, avoided digging into the deep PHP of WordPress for a very long time because I kind of knew what a huge can of worms that was going to be, and I knew that it would arrest me completely. And then once I finally did dig into that, you know, it was like all of this uh, latent energy and, and knowledge I had was sort of unleashed, and that's and I'm still in that space today. Interesting. And what uh, I'm just curious, like what or wh where did you go to high school, and then where did you go to college if you wanted? Uh, I went to a high school called St. Xavier in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. It's a private Catholic high school. It's all boys. Uh, so it was competitive, as you might imagine. Yeah. There's nothing else to do. <laughs> no <laughs> girls to hit on, so you gotta got to fight with each other. And, uh, and then I went to college at Georgia Tech. You did? I did. Oh, man. I went to Georgia Tech, too. Amazing. 03. Yeah. 03. I, crazy. Uh, okay, so I was a comp E, and I graduated uh, yes. in December of 03. So we perhaps oh, wow. crossed paths. Yep. Yeah, probably so. Interesting. Uh, you know, one of the most interesting experiences, and I actually talk about this on Twitter and in social media today. When we were there, CS was a required gen ed class for everyone in the school. Yeah. I don't recall any other class giving people as much fear and problems as that class. Uh, when I was a freshman, drinking was sort of uh, the main hobby for everybody in my dorm. <laughs> and uh, I would get completely hammered and tutor my uh, residence hall on CS <laughs> because they were so bad. They were so bad. I had like, you know, 100% in that class and everybody else is like, you know, 40% failing miserably. Can't deal with pseudocode or any of those concepts. Oh, uh, I always thought that was very interesting because I felt like it was a psychologically uh, a situation where people were psychologically, they were psyched out. Yeah. Because I don't think the concepts are really that bad, but for some reason people seem to have a very difficult time grasping some of the stuff that I think is like a one or a zero. Like it really is pretty basic. It's just a different way of thinking. And if you're yeah. not open to it and if you're scared of it, then uh, then you're definitely never cracking that wall. Yeah. But, uh, that's that, still, that's a formative thing for me. Just seeing all the pain and the fear that people had over this. It's like, man, man. That's right. I feel secure in my job because of this. It's <laughs> so true. 1501 and 1502. Yeah. There it is. Wow. You remember the numbers. My yeah. Goodness. Yeah. My wife, my wife went there too. So we like recall some of those classes from back in the day. That's oh, fun. Yeah. 
Wow, small world. Okay, well, moving on to thesis and focus, can you tell us when you got started with thesis and kind of? So I did the. So I was still in the design, mostly in the design space, in 2007. I was still doing freelance work, but I was really, really disenchanted with it. And uh, in the fall of 2007, uh, on a string of, uh, of previous theme successes, so so let's back the clock up a little bit. In 2000. Six, late 2006, early 2007, I guess. I, I, I'm not even sure the exact date I can find out from my site. But I released a theme called Cutline. It was a free WordPress theme that was adapted for WordPress.com. And I had had another theme before that that was pretty popular that was adapted for WordPress.com. Then my Cutline theme became very popular very fast. It immediately shot to number one on WordPress.com. It was the most used theme in the world. Very quickly after its release. Uh, it was sort of a very Spartan, um, New York Timesy kind of look. And in the fall of 2007, after I had sold off Cutline to a different group, uh, I'd kind of tired of tired of running it, and it was, it was sort of becoming a big support thing, and I was like, well, let's just ditch it. Um, I built sort of even more New York Timesy style design that became the, uh, the look that has been associated with Thesis forever, uh, the classic... Mm-hmm. You know, sort of Romanesque type layout with, uh, you know, a, a serif font and, uh, you know, pretty New York Timesy looking. Just go look at the New York Times homepage. You'll see what, what the original design was. And uh, so I built that in 2007. And then, like, while I was building this, I was like, man, I, I want to sell a premium theme, which wasn't really being done at the time. And doing that was much harder than I, than I realized, like setting up a store, especially back then. I was like, Oh my God. So I spent probably four months, we'll say December through March of 07 to 08 overlap. Finally got that store working and then launched thesis with like basically no features, uh, on March 29th, 2008. And that sort of was the I think there was a couple others that were for sale prior to that, but that was really sort of the birth of the premium theme market. And then in after three months of struggling, in July of 2000, 2008, I launched an affiliate program and partnered with copyblogger.com, and that blew the lid off the whole thing. That started everything we know today. It all started right then with that partnership and uh, made a ton of sales. Thesis was very popular for like three and a half years after that. Got it. And I think when when I got thesis back in 2013, um, I remember seeing all the testimonials and it was, I think it was a lot of people that got started in that window where it blew up and I was like, oh, I, I recognize half of those people. And it's yes. like, it's like, huge. oh, pretty much everyone who's been anyone in blogging in the last 12 years has had some contact with it at some point. Yeah, pretty cool. So the the big the big thing was like, hooking up with copy blogger and and launching an affiliate program for that. I don't, I don't believe it. there had ever been another affiliate program run on for themes. And uh, so with affiliate marketing, it was usually small margins on a lot of products. Like, you know, you get paid a $2 referral for somebody buying like a women's hair product or something like that. And then the, uh, the opposite end of that was like a web hosting referral. This was where people like web type people, bloggers were making the most money was off these web hosting referrals. But even so, your volume is limited because that's a big purchase. And then you have to sell a bunch of little purchases. Themes came in right in the middle, like at 30 Mm -hmm. bucks uh, per sale for affiliates. And that actually filled in a nice gap. And uh, that just opened the floodgates big time. I mean, that was a huge revenue opportunity for people who wanted to sell the growth of those themes and like the the demand and everything for them. Uh, Just really, it launched a whole new marketplace. Worth millions and millions of dollars. Wow, amazing! And you were just good timing and like showing up at the right time. So and- I mean, a lot of the success that's been attributed to Thesis. I mean, it was the best product in the space at the time, and absolutely blazed a ton of trails. Custom CSS files, um, uh, n- quarantining, PHP type customizations. All these things are kind of stuff that I pioneered early on. I've even got posts from my old blog in like 2006 advocating for custom CSS and that type yeah. of thing. But yeah. uh, so what was the original question there? Because I kind of got off on a little tangent there. Oh, you know what? I, I don't, I don't even remember either. You were, you were telling me a story, and I, I started I riffing and got off, got off course. Couldn't, couldn't recall what the original slant was. That's, that's totally fine. So, right. um, I guess 
moving forward, um, I'm curious about like setting up like the company and like running it as far as like all of a sudden, it, it sounds like you were kind of a one man shop for a little while. You started scaling a little bit. You mentioned support being a bit of an issue. So when it when thesis blew up, how did you handle your company? Uh, so it's kind of interesting. I uh, a big theme that I haven't really returned to in some time, but it's still definitely true is this idea of gravity. Okay, so for me, this this in this sense, the use of the term gravity means like you are you are undertaking some activity, producing all this energy, putting some output out there, and stuff is going to find you by weight of your gravity, by the sheer force of what you were doing. You will pull things in. You will attract things that could be helpful. You can track the right kinds of energy. You also attract a lot of the wrong kinds of energy. But um, I pulled from what I was attracting for help in the early days. So I had people who were eager to provide support and wanted to because they wanted to learn the platform. They wanted to help people. They felt like they had some knowledge and saw opportunity. And so I played to that in the early days with uh, with my support, like probably the second half of 08. I was doing everything up until then and still doing almost everything until early 2009. And then I started to get a little more aggressive with uh, development so that, you know, the, if, you, if you're into development, you're also into testing and that ends up taking a lot of time. Uh, and it's nice to be able to develop like in a vacuum without having to hear a bunch of signals because you're going to get a lot of wires crossing and it becomes very hard to make decisions. So I sort of started to quarantine myself and uh, I had – in the early days, I had three people come to me through, you know, just by virtue of what I was doing. And they were, you know, very helpful and, and uh, significant parts of the company for a long time. Cool. So I just, it was just sort of organic in that way. All right. Yeah. And I, I was going to say just from some of the work that I do, I know like email support and that sort of thing. I can appreciate what you're saying. You need to be quarantined so your mind can do what it needs to do without so many distractions and Maybe you have a bad egg in there every now and then that's um, driving you crazy. But at least that's what happens to It's me. inevitable. <laughs> inevitable. If you're contacting people, that's what's going to happen. Uh, it's really remarkable that even I even got through those early days, that anyone did, quite frankly, because uh, it seems to me that over the last decade, people's desires have increased and their ability and willingness to tackle them themselves has decreased. So we've had... Trends moving in opposite directions. In the early days, everyone was sort of that pioneering and had this sort of like gunslinger mentality that they were going to, you know, get in there and hammer on some things and make it work. And that actually, uh, that actually was something of a pressure relief valve, even though the landscape really didn't support it at all. Like it was much harder to customize back in the day. Interesting. Interesting. So, fast forwarding to sort of current day, can you tell us about focus? And I'm just going to throw out some uh, some of the sort of taglines and stuff, optimized for speed, speed and clarity, visitor first approach. And I'm just going to let you, Chris, talk about that stuff. All right. We got we to have a segue to, to lead into this reality to answer those questions. So we'll, we'll, we're going to go back to 2010. Okay. This, there was a, a big blow up on social media. I did an interview with Andrew Warner of Mixergy.com. I did an interview with him and we talked about the success of thesis and, and like the growth of WordPress themes. And apparently I don't remember exactly the mechanics of it, but I think Matt Mullenweg of WordPress reached out to Andrew and was like, I'd like to respond to this or to talk about, you know, stuff that he found unsavory that Andrew and I had spoken about. Basically he wanted to attack me over the licensing of thesis. And the reality was thesis never even had a software license. And also Disclaimer for audience, nobody cares about software licenses. You're probably hearing this thinking, who gives a damn? And you're right. Who does give a damn? Nobody. That's the true answer to that question. But in reality, and back in 2010, I was kind of uh, publicly lambasted for this, and Thesis never had a software license. Never had a software license. I sold like $6 million worth of product with no software license. Probably not. Eh, like $4 million with no software license. And, uh, and then I was attacked publicly for this. And I don't like being attacked, and I'm certainly not going to be, get attacked and then just amend my behavior. You know, like after the attack, oh, come to Jesus moment. I recant. You know, please uh, please resolve me of my sins. Let me just do the right thing so you stop attacking me. I'm never going to behave that way. It's just never going to happen. And, uh, and so, you know, you know, if you bite me in public, I'm going to bite back. And some people didn't like the optics of that. Other people did, which is interesting, you know. 
I prefer a, a guy who sticks by his guns when he's under duress. Uh, that's not everybody's cup of tea, especially if you already have favorites going in. But what happened in the wake of this was that it, uh, it completely destroyed version one of my business. It, it, it shattered it and then caused uh, some course corrections to occur. So needless to say, this happened in July of 2010. So I'd been doing a lot of thinking between like July of 2010 and the end of that year. It had become apparent to me through my continued development work with Thesis that – so what I was attempting to do was to provide a foundation that could be infinitely modified to, in, to any flavor you want while retaining performance, putting that first, not committing these performance sins that just are hallmarks of, of WordPress themes and have been for so long. So I wanted to commit no performance ends. I wanted to be 100% web standards compliant. I want to give Google and other search engines exactly what they wanted with no BS. I mean exactly. Not like it would be nice if. No, I want it to be this. So I did not want to compromise on the, uh, the code underneath, you know, what was under the hood. I wanted a perfect engine. Uh, and then, like I said, I want to be infinitely customizable. But the, the way that the landscape had been up to that point it would not accommodate this. That was not going to be possible. And there were also some definite other points of leverage that were going to be uh, available at the code level that had never been done. Uh, and I, I saw these opportunities. I began to, to you know, really have a good vision of what that might look like. And uh, so that was, that was pressing on me pretty hard. I could have continued with the current course, which was very successful. And still at the time, even though I said my company sort of uh, – my, my course got corrected there and I had to make some other decisions, the company was still very, very successful. I was selling like $6,000 worth of product a day. It was ridiculous. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, I didn't care about that. I cared about like trying to solve these problems. That's what was eating at me. It wasn't like, oh, how do I maintain these sales? I didn't care. Um, and so I set about refactoring what thesis was like, like in building this engine to, to do these things I just described, you know, to make it so that you wouldn't have to modify the core, to make it so that your customizations would be bulletproof, et cetera, et cetera. And what happened was that ended up being a two, really into, all told, like a three year journey of building and testing this thing. And it, it, I didn't know what it was when I started building it. Huh. And then when I was done, I realized what I had done was, completely replace the WordPress theme system. And the reality of the situation is the WordPress theme system is a single file with a big if-then statement. If this, then this. If this, then this. And that if-then statement that runs the WordPress theme system, I'm saying using quotes because it's no system at all, is uh, reliant on the naming of files that exist in the active theme folder. Like, categories dash whatever for a specific categories template. I mean, it is the most non-system system in the world. If you know anything about computer science, it's a sham. <laughs> and so I replaced one file with a terrible if-then statement and a faulty file naming convention with an object-oriented modular piece of software to deliver templates and thus themes mm -hmm. and also styles and everything that goes along with that. It ended up being a monumental undertaking. In fact, it's probably, with the exception of like you know the editor to do to do content, uh, it's probably the most most difficult mm -hmm. uh, functional piece and like the the biggest and most important because this you know the, your HTML output is your website. Yeah. You know what I mean? It is. And how well you can customize it, how well you can integrate things. Like, it really built the thing. You know, I realized when I finished that, like, why didn't this exist in WordPress before? Why had no one done this? <laughs> Who has three years of time and this sort of insane determination to achieve that outcome? You know, I only had that much time because the company was making so much money. Right. That's real talk. Couldn't have done it if it wasn't printing money. Could not have mm -hmm. done it. Wow. So that was... That was and three so, years. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So I, I rolled out. So this was this was real bad, and this is an interesting story. Uh, I, I talked about this publicly because, you know, I talk about what I'm doing. I always have. And uh, unfortunately, I never should have talked about what I was doing. But I didn't have the foresight to know this. And so talking about it, you know, I was talking about this probably in December of 2010 on social media. And so fomenting this idea that Thesis 2 was going to be a thing, and everyone loved Thesis 1, so it was like, well, let's see what, you know, the – the godfather of the theme space is going to come up with next. And so there's a lot of expectation and a lot of anticipation for what I might do. Well, that dragged on all the way through 2011. I worked on it the whole year. 
Uh, I rented an office at some point, I think in late 2011, and hired a developer and really tried to take it full time because I just knew what was in front of me and uh, and continued to work on it all the way through 2012. We did this big marketing push. I had Derek Halpern of socialtriggers.com doing all my content and all my marketing at the time, and he really wanted something new to market. Like He was chomping at the bit, and who could blame him? You know what I mean? We've got this huge customer list. We've got all this enthusiasm. Like, definitely let's capitalize on this. So I was on board with that. But what happened was this dragged out over such a long period of time that people get frustrated. And in addition to that, trying to create some of these or capitalize on some of these marketing opportunities that just naturally occurred as a result of all this uh, creates external pressure to deliver. And but the problem is with marketing, you have to have a date, right? Can't just be an open ended promise. It has to occur at a time. That way everyone can, that's how it works. Um, Unfortunately, when you're developing something that you don't even totally understand the scope of, and how could you? Because there was nothing that existed prior to this. You know what I mean? It's not like you just look at this and say, oh, this is exactly what we need. It was never like that. There's always some new wart to uncover with WordPress, it seems. And so this development just dragged on and on and on. And finally, when we decided to put a date on it, uh, you know, we really aimed for October 1st, 2012. it always seemed like that was going to be achievable, but the reality was it was not. And even when something seems achievable, you know, like in my life, honestly, like add nine months. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe add more. And that sounds crazy to people, but like this is the reality. This is the reality of developing and testing and engineering and throwing stuff against the wall and trying to figure it out, especially if you're, you're uh, forging new territory that has not been forged before. And so what happened with that is that all this anticipation happened. Thesis 2 was released well before it should have been. Uh, it actually – what people could use when I delivered it actually had fewer options and fewer flex, less flexibility than what people had been accustomed to before. So from an end user perspective, this is a failure. I don't understand the mechanisms underneath this. I don't care. I care about what I can use and what's relevant to me. And what I am seeing is not a good thing. And I sympathize with that viewpoint completely. And those people were correct in their assessment. And what happened was uh, because of this, there was a terrible, terrible negative cascading effect as a result. People became discontent. I was working feverishly to make changes and to continue to try and bring this thing to light. Uh, and I still had, you know, the reality was I kept hammering away at this thing nonstop until July of 2013. So another good like nine months after I the release date. But during that nine months, it just got hammered with negativity. I mean, it was like literally nothing but negativity. There was almost no positivity at all. The only people who were positive were people who really understood the WordPress theme environment and like kind of grasped what I had built and what I was attempting to achieve. But those people don't pay the bills. (laughs) And what happened, but what really sucked, and this has become a theme here lately because I've been talking about affiliates. What really sucked is when the big affiliates abandoned me. They abandoned me because... My product was no longer selling as easily or as frictionlessly, and all the chatter around it is negative. It's just not worth – if you're an affiliate, it's not worth fighting an uphill battle at all. You sell the hot stuff. That's all you sell. But – and I think think that moment was actually pivotal pivotal for the entire WordPress marketplace, not just for my business. You know, that that really signaled a shift away from from my products. Mm Mm-hmm. Because nobody was going to wait and see what I came up with after the fact. It was just thesis two is a failure, full stop. Then that was sort of the narrative that that became real. Now I kept working at it because I knew it wasn't a failure, not at all. It delivered, uh, it enabled me to deliver a much greater degree of flexibility that I'm finally capitalizing on today, which we will get there in just a little bit. <laughs> However, um, what happened when affiliates abandoned me and started favoring other stuff is it really became clear that they were favoring exactly what the, the salvo that the market you know wanted right now. The market was foaming at the mouth for specific looks. And then there was this idea, there's another theme called Headway that sort of started this. And I was working towards this. Actually, when I started making Thesis 2, I thought I was going to make a drag and drop editor for design. That's what I thought I was going to build. When I got into the process of doing that and actually working with something like that, I realized that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Everything's an idiosyncratic snowflake. You have no... A systematic level of control over anything. Like I said, everything's an idiosyncratic. Every adjustment is idiosyncratic. You're dragging a box out to this width on this particular template. Well, it doesn't apply to every template. And then you're adding idiosyncratic CSS for this particular thing. You've got spacing that's off. You've got sizing that's off. You've got all these 
you know, problems that are inherent to that type of editor. So I abandoned that very early on when I realized what the problems were. But that line of thinking was intuitive. And so that's what everyone began to build. That's what began to sell. That's what affiliates began to push. It was a snowball effect that led us to the page builders and stuff that we have today. Now, I would never sit here and deny that those things are useful for people in the sense that they enable people who don't know anything to deliver some, an outcome on a web page. The problem with the outcome, a random outcome on a web page is that it actually has to work. <laughs> it actually has to load in under 10 seconds. It actually has to be configurable if you ever want to change anything in the future. And that's where the problems start to arise. And anyone who's dealt with these things is going to be like, ah, oh, yeah, I see what he's talking about here. I totally get that. I ran into that same brick wall. And, uh, and that, that whole momentum from that still exists today. And only recently, and I think pretty much because of my messaging starting in the second half of last year, uh, we're fighting back against that because it's just not the right answer. It creates these untenable situations where you have a Frankensight that you can no longer control or manage. It's slow. It's clunky. Like people come to me all the time. My site's slow. I'm like, I can't help you. You've got layers of crap, so many layers of crap. You, you just could never afford to pay me what it would take to undo this. Uh, and, and then there's another problem that I spoke about in some of my other videos, but it's like, Freelance design is not what it was. Freelance development is not what it was 10 years ago. Everyone who's worth a damn has migrated to an agency where they have a cushy salary and they have better gigs. Agencies aren't going to touch you if you don't have $25,000. So at least this massive hole. So you can either take some, some bottom, you know, bottom feeder off Fiverr and hope they know what they're doing when the reality is it's going to screw up your website. Or you have to pony up for the agency. And this left this huge chasm in the middle of people who can't help themselves anymore. And so that my messaging now, I'm seeing a widespread appeal and a lot of resonance uh, because people have have, you know, painted themselves into a corner with their, these Frankensites, which is the only thing that's been sold in the last six years. Yeah. And so that leads us to focus, which is my new product now, which is so with thesis two that rollout, the problem was I did the foundational layer that nobody even knew. Uh, nobody even thought this needed to exist. Nobody realizes this was a need. So I delivered a need that didn't exist. So no wonder it wasn't very popular. <laughs> but the, the skin layer, which is a, a analogous to a theme on WordPress, that is where the functionality and the stuff that works for you lives. And <clears throat> focus is a full scale realization of all the stuff I've worked on for years. Uh, systematic approach to design, where if you change one thing, everything else adjusts to accommodate these changes. Intelligent changes. It's not about making just one spot change here. Spot changes are for phonies. In, in code parlance, that's analogous to a concept known as hard coding. Hard coding is not how you build software. Um, and so focus, uh, in addition to being uh, functionally, you know, finally like the full presentation of, of what I've been trying to do for years, uh, in terms of the actual design itself, it is a response to this emergent environment that we now find ourselves in. The reality is we don't use websites the way we used them in 2010. We don't browse blogs anymore. We click on links from social media. We click on links from email. And we click on specific referrals wherever we find them. And when we go to a page, we expect to receive whatever value was promised. And in most cases, once that is exhausted, we will leave. There is not much of this delve further into unless we are exploring a product that we wish to buy. People perform research and go deep when they're reading reviews, stuff like that. This is sort of the new social internet, and our behaviors have changed in response to this new emergent social internet. In addition, we have external pressures coming from the screens on which we access these things. A lot of stuff happens on social. 99% of everything you know with WordPress, Elementor, Divi, Avada, all the crap that these things spit out is designed for desktop. That's not the reality anymore. And the, the, the absolute reality of this is that anything that happens on desktop has to be massaged into an environment that will work on mobile. The number one problem people have with WordPress today is I made some change to my site, integrated a plugin, did something, something broke on mobile. It's because you're using a piece of crap that was not designed to do this. You're using something that was designed to satiate your immediate need and all of this other stuff under the surface. It's like the tip of an iceberg, and then underneath is, you know, Everest. <laughs> Everest has not been accommodated, but this little, you know, little peak where you're chilling with your tent is good. Uh, 
And I think people are coming to the realization that that, that is an untenable situation. And so focus is, uh, is my answer to many of those of these, ex- you know, extant problems. And uh, I think, you know, people look at it and they say, well, this looks vanilla. This is not what I was expecting. That's probably true. It's not what I expected either. But it is a response to the reality that we now find ourselves in. And on top of that, it's fully configurable. I deliver you vanilla. That way there's not anything you have to remove to get to where you want to go. Mm-hmm. It's all adding. That's something else that WordPress assemblers, people who work with sites, will understand. If you work with a foundation, you generally have to undo a bunch of stuff that you didn't like about that foundation and then add your own stuff. I hate that layer. I don't want to undo anything. Anything I want to, you know, that needs to be undone angers me. So I want to start with something and only add exactly what I need and know that I am doing everything in the most efficient way possible. Got it. That was a solid answer, Chris. <laughs> a long-winded one to get to where we are today, but I think that history and that context matters. And I, yeah, I mean, and we went all the way back to 2010. To that's amazing. So, um, to sort of summarize, to make sure I got it generally right, um, you have a more sort of efficient foundation to build focus upon, and you've been working on it for years and this current iteration is a bit of a reaction to the bloated themes that are out there, page builders that are slow and that sort of theme. So people can actually like use it on, I'm pointing at my phone that you can't see, but mobile and tablets where we're getting, you know, what, 50, 80% of our traffic most of the time, right? Well, I mean, it depends on the site, sure, but sure. there's a huge enough segment. Like I said, the, the behaviors that we see are click throughs from social media. Most social media click throughs are, are, you know, they're trending towards mobile click. Yep. And so that's the reality of how people are going to see your site and how they're going to receive information. There's so much to this too, but like, you know, in most parts of the world, uh, downloading a page on a phone is not done over Wi-Fi. It's done over broadband and broadband's not cheap. There's so much baked in crap with your typical WordPress page. So if you use a tool called webpagetest.org, you can see this. But your average WordPress page is going to come in at something like 2.3 megabytes. That means that phone's going to have to download 2.3 megabytes, chew up 2.3 megabytes of data just to serve one page. Contrast that with with my stuff. You know, if it's over 200 kilobytes, like what are you doing? (laughs) Which is, you know, 10%. Right. Ten percent is large. So it, this is efficient in so, on so many levels like this. You know, if we want to talk about um, like environmental friendliness, being energy conscious, mm-hmm. you know, conscious mm-hmm. of what we are consuming. I don't really understand how you can justify any other approach. Uh, you know, this this is ticking all of the boxes like it would be nice if it would be nice if the only thing it's not ticking is this ego satisfying like overdone design sort of desire but this has been the internet for 10 years like nobody cares i think we're blind to all this crap we see big images we just scroll down to the content we don't give a shit what that image is right. pardon my french there yeah. but like people don't care we no. don't care i think of your experience on mobile right you load a page it loads in clunky parts it's got this big header thing it loads an ad at the bottom you're you're trying to scroll to get down and you accidentally tap on the thing that popped up on the bottom it's yeah. madness yes Stop i was gonna it. say that was I was reading something this morning and I'm like, just get rid of the ads. What are we doing here? I don't care about like you said, no one gives a shit about the uh, the header. And like, who cares? I just want the answer to my question. So exactly. Exactly. We want that value exchange quickly. And, you know, I mean, I could go on about this. There's a hundred different angles that I could take this with and go into big discussion about marketing. Like, should you have email pop ups? Will these convert better? Yeah, sure they do. But the people you're acquiring are crappy leads. You know, it's about value. It's about like really connecting. It's not about just, you know, trawling the ocean with a large net and catching, you know, you've caught your tuna, but you also caught two endangered sharks and you caught some other stuff and a narwhal. It's yeah. like, come on, man. <laughs> you know, not, not all these are good transactions. Exactly. Exactly. So I had a couple other questions, um, but I think I know the answer to a few of them. So I would say a lot of plugins on the site you're probably against, right? Extreme prejudice. <laughs> Extreme prejudice. There's a ton of reasons why. Okay, so first of all, let's backtrack. Mentioned page builders earlier. Focus works great with page builders. And in fact, if you're hell-bent on using a page builder, you ought to use it with a focus foundation because at least the rest of your site ain't going to be a disaster. That's that's rule number one. Is focus friendly with page builders? Absolutely. You cannot work with page builders in a better environment than this. But, but 
page builders, and pretty much every other plugin that does anything you're going to want to do is going to commit performance sins with impunity. With impunity. There's reasons for this. It's not like a, you know, specifically just blaming developers. They are trying to shoehorn their stuff into an environment that is pure chaos. It is pure chaos because you have to work with other themes. If you only had to work with Focus, plugin developers could do a bang-up job and always preserve performance. But that's not the reality that we deal with. They have to work with all these other crappy themes that are done up in a variety of different ways. So they necessarily have to commit performance sins to get the thing to just work without you having to do anything. So that's what their whole business model is predicated on, making sure it just works for you with no hassle so they don't get support requests. But the trade-off that you are making with this exchange is to say, well, my site's now going to be not very performant. And if I ever want to make it better performing, I'm going to have to go through a lot of hoops mm -hmm. and stuff that most people are not qualified to do. Indeed. So it's yeah. kind of devil, it's a devil's bargain. It's not yeah. good. And I was going to say I was using a page builder kind of landing page thing called uh, Thrive Themes or uh, yep. Thrive Architect. Not a, not a fan. I couldn't wait to get it off um, my sites and just use Focus. And it it took a little work because it was, you know, oh, yeah. you know how it is deeply to rip entangled, something out. Deeply yeah. entangled in your content and everything else. But I'm happy to say my site loads way faster and looks better. And it's just, you know, I want to minimize the touch points just in general. Yes, yes. And, and I I realize that people really don't care about you know, the little feature box or if I can have columns or whatever. Um, they just want an answer to their question and they don't want my ads or whatever to get in the way. So yeah, getting rid of Thrive Architect was fantastic. And little story, um, I had some issues. So I, I tried to get some support. Didn't go well. They have, they're very backed up and it took days to get an answer. And then they were like, uh, remove all the other plugins you have. And I'm like, it's a course site. I can't remove all the plugins like that's not that's not a an answer but i submitted a support request to you chris and you answered say, back i think i recall this yeah in like a day and over the weekend and i was like it's uh chris answering my support request so yeah that's a uh, good job on that that's amazing thank you thank you there's actually some information behind that that's quite interesting i think so yep. i can only imagine what these other companies support issues m must look like i mean a, th a thorn in my side for years has been the nature of the questions I am asked in support, right? There are patterns that emerge. Like it's very clear there's going to be some patterns. And generally speaking, for, for product X, the patterns that emerge through support are showing you weaknesses in your platform or weaknesses in your messaging, right? People are asking questions they shouldn't be asking or people are asking the same sorts of questions and you have a problem you need to fix. And... This stuff really wears you down over time. If you are not able to answer in a patternized way, if, if every issue is a snowflake, that sucks. If you can answer things in a patternized way, you begin to iron out the support landscape. And if you really want to take this into a dystopian future, if you want to draw this out as far as you can, ideally you'd have an AI bot be able to answer every support request because everything follows a pattern. Okay, That, that would be the goal. If you want to run the most efficient company you can, there, your, your software is so patternized, your landscape is so patternized that everything fits into this and can be codified in some way. That's, what I, that's part of what my mission was with Focus and why I've really tried to sort of set up these guardrails for people to operate within because I know if you stay within these, you can be successful and get the outcomes you want. You may not be able to get some of the designy crap you wanted, but your expectations suck. You need to confront this reality. I've had to confront this reality. Things I thought I wanted, I have discarded because I realized that they are now worthless. Right. This is just part of growth. Like you have to be willing to let go of things you thought you wanted. Uh, but what has, has happened is that this has really streamlined my support and the types of questions that are asked. So my day every morning starts with I look at the support forums. I try to give the best, most detailed answers possible, not just to satisfy what the request is, but to really illuminate what is going on with the platform. That's already been successful since February 6th, which I think is – that gives me some, some good fulfillment. But in terms of the support request by email, I mean it's dried up to almost nothing. It's dried up to almost nothing. So no wonder I answer them on the weekends and stuff like that. I got my coffee. I'm chilling up here. I got nothing better to do. Might as well answer a question. Uh, and so it's easy for me, and I imagine these other companies, it's just hell. Yeah. I bet. I just – you know, ugh, I can only imagine. It looks like a battlefield after World War One. I'm sure. <laughs> so um... – 
Do you do the copywriting on DIY themes? I like, do. I am everything. That's all. Awesome. A hundred percent of everything is me. <laughs> okay, so you got a lean team right now. Just it's you, right? It's me. Yep. So what, what's your background in copywriting? Because it is really good. I'll, I'll put a link for folks to get a little tutorial uh, as an, an example of great copywriting. But it's awesome. It sounds just like you. Go ahead. What, Thank you. That's uh, a great compliment. Um, well, I went through school at at pretty high levels took the highest level classes I was able to take at each point. And I feel like I had a really good background in, in sort of everything. And, and um, you know, like my grasp of English and stuff was pretty good, but I was not really, I would not have considered myself a good writer, mm-hmm. like coming out of high school through college and all that stuff. But I was, my early internet career, I so I had a good background, but it wasn't refined. But in my early internet career, I was exposed to people that were good at this stuff. Uh, Brian Clark of Copy Blogger, he's good. I just like, you know, some of his actions toward me, but that doesn't mean he was not good at what he did. Uh, Derek Calpern, working with him was an absolute treat. He's great. Uh, I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot from watching others. Um, because I have been solely responsible for my product forever, it matters to me whether or not I'm connecting. Mm-hmm. Uh, it matters to me that that it sells. So, like, I've had okay. some some pressure just on me to try and improve these things. And, you know, I've been iterating on this stuff for 13 plus years. And so I have gotten better at that. I think I understand the nature of Internet communications because I'm so active and I've been in this landscape for so long. Uh, so, I mean, there's a ton of experience there. I guess what I'm trying to sure. say is so I had a good background, good foundation, ton of experience, ton of exposure to people who are good at this stuff and a desire to refine my own techniques to make mm-hmm. sure that it is effective. But on that note, I've always considered myself, not really considered myself, but like I've always been sort of a polymath type person, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? I don't like to just be good at one thing. In fact, I'm sort of, uh, I think I live sort of an interesting, unique life. All I do is try to get good at things. I build skills. Yeah. Well, what's some other stuff away from internet? Oh, Lord, I've done everything. Uh, I mean, sports has been a big part of my life. Uh, For a while, it was baseball, then it was softball, then it was tennis. Uh, Now I do golf. I'm crazy about that. I got a freaking golf simulator in my house. I hit balls every night. Uh, for the, like for the last five years, I played a ton of golf. I haven't played yeah. hardly any golf since I really started to work on Focus. But um, so I do that. Uh, you know, video games. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, I build Legos. <laughs> I mean, it's just all kinds of crazy stuff. But you know, my whole whole deal with that is like understand the art. And to get better and, and, you know, ultimately to uh, sort of systematize everything and kind of figure out bulletproof ways to be successful. Uh, so mastery, I guess, is my thing. Ping pong. Yeah. Anything. I played pretty high level ping pong in the past. Did you, did you have uh, brothers? Nope. No siblings? Only child. Only child? I was like, yep. you see, you got that competitive, uh, it must have been the, uh, the high school. I, you know, I've just always been super competitive. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just in the genes. Very cool. Well, it doesn't sound like you have any other online ventures or anything like that, like themes and, and design is, is your thing, right? Or did you have some other stuff going on? Uh, Just curious. Not really. So um, I dabble with stuff before I did the, the premium theme thing. But one, one thing that has emerged through that work that's sort of separate, and I'll tie this in just a second, but uh, I came up with the golden, ra- golden ratio typography is the concept. Uh, that I started to really kind of kind of work on in late 2011. And what this is, so we'll go back to Cutline. I mentioned that theme I made 100 years ago. I remember I did a big update for this that I had adjusted the line height of the primary text. Okay? So like the way the paragraphs looked, I'd made the spacing between the lines a little bit bigger. And I was just delighted with this. Just delighted with this. But I remember that I had just, I like spent a whole day just making these little tweaks. And, and, and then like settling on a result that to me looked better and, and provided a more pleasant reading experience. And I just love that. But then I really started to try and un- unpack the mechanisms behind that. Like I wanted to understand like why, why did this look better? What did this mean? What did this imply? And it, it led me to realize that there was probably a way to – like there's dimensionality to text. There's a certain font size. The column's only so wide. What it is, you know, having a mathematical background, knowing, knowing that I could look at this and say, there's probably a best fit solution for this. And if there's a best fit solution, that means there's a curve so you can fit along, you know, an infinite number of points. And so that led me to 
dive into this whole golden ratio typography thing. And so I, I published my initial manifesto on that in December of 2011. Uh, the, the basic math there had was, you know, full of mistakes. There was definitely plenty of mistakes and faulty assumptions, et cetera. But I also uncovered some concepts that persist to, that have really defined what golden ratio typography was. So my finger was on the pulse. It just needed to be refined. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I introduced some of that stuff into thesis two skins in October of 2012 and then continued to sort of massage that work on those. I released the personified skin for thesis in like February or March of 2014. And that really had a fuller suite of golden ratio typography. Like it really sort of, I sort of understood what the, you know, so it affects more than just typography. All the spacing in the layout can be derived from this. So like my, my basic hypothesis or theory is that, well, hypothesis I, I reckon, uh, is that all the dimensionality on a page needs to be related in some way. It will have a harmonious effect on a viewer if it's all related. The question is how do you make, it's all, make sure it's all related? Well, there's different ways. All of the font sizes that are in use could be related through some scale, a scale that's related through this, a similar proportion. All the white space, line heights of text, padding, margins, all of these things that define spacing on the page could also be derived from those same base units. They can all be connected. And if that's true, if you change one thing, you can change everything in a systematic way. So that's speaking to this process that I was that I mentioned earlier of, of trying to figure out ways to do design without having to go through and do idiosyncratic spot fixes or hard coding. And so I was aware of this, you know, and I, this uh, potential enhancement that could be made. And I rolled this out in the personified skin, but then I even started to understand it farther and refine it farther over the, you know, over the next few years. And then by the time I really got into building focus late last fall, I realized that the, or actually last summer is when I did these refinements on the golden ratio typography calculator. I uh, went back through all that math and realized that like, or figured out a way to make sure nothing in it was arbitrary at all. And that everything was tuned according to the golden ratio. And like, you know, I figured out what that, what that meant and what right. that output should be. And now that is baked into focus as well. So this is literally the first design system of its kind ever anywhere Everything is related. Everything is mechanical. Nothing is done with this manual input. It is all informed by math and is therefore infinitely flexible and scalable. It can adapt to any environment. It can be anything. And it's not even, uh, it's not even restricted to use on the Internet. This could, this could be applied to books, magazines, periodicals, anything. Uh, Anywhere text appears. And for the people that don't use Focus yet, I can tell you, basically, you put in your font size and then everything else propagates out. You can tweak it, right, Chris? But that's yes, you the can, general you can idea. spot tweak. And that's you, only you in response to, to known yeah. support requests. Yeah, you would never do this. <laughs> if you knew what you were doing, you would never do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, you just put in the font and then everything else just is this. It's spaced properly and all that stuff, right? And actually, for the people who are font. And actually, Chris, I yes. lost you for about 15 seconds there. So okay, no bigs, no bigs. Uh, where do you want to go back to? We could just say uh, I was talking about you just adjust the main font size and then it goes from there. Yes. So, so for the people who are paying attention and thinking, not all fonts are the same. Like their physical characteristics are not the same. There's a dimension known as the X height, which is the height the ratio of the height of a lowercase letter to the height of an uppercase letter. It, X is used as the, the main lowercase character for this. That's why it's called the X height. And some fonts have a very small X height. Some fonts have a very large X height. The trend now in digital fonts is to have a large X height. We figured out that this is easier for reading. But the di bottom line is these differences in X height require some tuning adjustments to make sure everything is perfect. And the golden ratio typography formula accounts for that if I have measured the font in question and identified its exact metrics. So I do this too. I spend some time, uh, you know, like whenever I introduce Google fonts onto the platform, I will measure those fonts using a proprietary technique that I've developed. <laughs> uh, I have videos on this. It's not like it's a secret, but, um, 
you know, so I, I literally measure, measure the physical characteristics of fonts so that I can tune them perfectly within the context of, of this stuff. Very cool. I like it. And it's funny enough, I, I didn't even realize it, but I have a concept called the keyword golden ratio. It's not based on a, any real um, math, like your your visual uh, you know, golden golden type. Sorry, is it the... It's golden ratio typography. Is golden the, ratio typography. Yeah. But the golden ratio, it's a good branding thing from a marketing standpoint. So one of my friends mentioned it to me and I was like, hey, I'm going to go forward with, <laughs> with that if it's cool with you. So anyway... You throw in golden ratio and people like to hear that. So Yes, yes. It's a uh, yeah, positive branding on golden <laughs> yeah. ratio. So um, we're winding down uh, towards the end here. And you, you mentioned a few mistakes that you made in the past, but I wanted to give you a chance. Were there any other mistakes that you made um, that you want to share? Maybe people can learn from those mistakes across your journey here. Yeah, definitely. Um so one mistake is setting up expectations. Expectation management is so much huger than I ever realized, but it is absolutely critical for your sanity as a business owner or somebody trying to you know, undertake some activity. Uh, if you're going to be working with people, with customers, whomever, uh, expectation management is absolutely critical. And it is your fault if you set up bad expectations, even if you feel like it's unfair or maybe you know, people were making assumptions you have to understand that people are going to be doing this and this informs expectations and therefore you have to manage those expectations. It's critical to manage expectations. Next thing, it's critical. You don't want people anticipating your next move too much. Number one, it telegraphs it for anyone who wants to be in competition with you. So therefore it's not really that intelligent to do from that perspective, but you can cannibalize your own audience by creating anticipation for something that you may or not may or may not be able to deliver on. So this whole under promise over deliver could not be more true. And that's sort of, you know, the anticipation expectation, that's sort of a, you know, entangled sort of concept, but that's critical. Another thing that's critical is partnerships. It's not critical to form them. It's critical to understand what you're doing before you enter into them and that to manage expectations there as well. Gotcha. And to clearly delineate, um, need to clearly delineate the circumstances under which you are happy to operate between both parties so that those lines are not crossed because that's going to create tension and those te the tension will ultimately corrode that partnership. And so you don't want to have one partner uh, sort of feeling like they are driving the ship mm -hmm. when you feel like you, you have a different ship that you want to be driving because they're going to invariably want to turn in different directions at times, and that's going to be tough to navigate. So it's nice to have that stuff out beforehand. Mm -hmm. And But the problem is when we see dollar signs and we see rewards, we end up making those choices in spite of known conflicts. And that might, might lead to money and success in the short term, but in the long term, you know, in a three-year window, it might be good. In a six-year window, it might have a lot of problems for you and less problems for them. Like you need to, you know, think about this stuff beforehand. It's not free. And immediate reward – like, like I said, even if it lasts three years, uh, may not always be a good thing. Easy for me to say because I already had one good successful run-up. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I don't know if I'd be able to traverse that landscape in a way that satisfies me if I had not already had one successful run-up. Got it. Um, another thing, um, or another, another pitfall, I guess, is uh, – is becoming reactive in your business. You do not want to become reactive to your customers or to complaints or to your competition. The second you switch to a reactive business model, you are forever chasing your own ass and you are ne you're, you're no longer calling the shots. You're no longer in charge of your own business. You are hoping to satisfy something because you feel like there's a disconnect between what you offer and what the market wants. So you are trying to please someone else. When your business has shifted to that, morale is going to drop. Everything is – it's just going to be this constant cycle of you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. You need to understand that going in. If you have become reactive, it's over. Uh, and I think that there has been times when my business has been – when everyone – all the energy around me saying, hey, Chris, you need to become reactive, 
and my whole thing is I never want to I'm, I'm just not wired to behave that way but if you are surrounded by people who, who don't understand that it is critical not to become reactive then you'll you will be in a, a problematic situation as well and really this is probably of all the things I just mentioned this is probably the most important one mm-hmm. it depends on how you're wired some people are wired to please I'm not wired to please I'm wired to innovate Mm-hmm. Which means I need to sort of actually not respond to criticism, uh, but really understanding yourself and if you're if you're the type that doesn't want to be reactive, uh, being thrust into that role is just is just the worst. It's just the worst. Yes. Yeah, I can totally relate to that, and I don't know if I'm on the innovative side specifically, but reactive like doesn't work for me. And every now and then I catch myself just reacting to, well, we'll just say like internet comments in a general yeah, sense. Yeah. And it's like, what am I doing? That, that makes no sense for me to react to those folks. So. Uh, yeah. Another thing that's come up here this year that I've really kind of uh, tapped into and, and, and started to internalize is this, this notion that defining boundaries, defining mm-hmm. boundaries. This is the hardest thing to do in business because we don't want to upset people. We don't want to create a situation like an emotional or psychological situation with a customer that might be uneasy. Mm-hmm. The natural inclination is to never do this. Right. But that means you have no boundaries. If you have no boundaries, that means someone else is setting your boundaries for you. It's the same sort of thing as being reactive. It's just a different way of looking at it. But so we think, especially when we're just getting into business and we don't have a lot of sales, we think, well, if I define boundaries, I'm necessarily cutting off some potential sales. Yes, you are. And those sales you're cutting off are saving you from dealing mm-hmm. with a bunch of crap. <laughs> Not all money that gets in your pocket is good money. Right. The stuff that is implied on the back end of that may be terrible. Uh, some of the situations you find yourself in, the patterns of behavior that are established as a result of your acquiescence uh, can lead to bad places. Mm-hmm. You must have boundaries, and, and boundaries are freedom for you. And what matters you know, as a business operator, is it the customer that matters or is it you? Well, i got news for you. All my customers don't have squat if I, don't, if I lose interest tomorrow. Everyone is effed. Yeah. But if I establish boundaries and continue to operate in a space where I am happy, then everyone who's relying on me is in a good position. So it is not just for me. It's for everyone else's sake as well. I have boundaries so my customers can win. Mm -hmm. I have boundaries so that I am sane. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. Right on. Well said. All right. Last question here, and then we'll let people, uh, or we'll tell people where they can find you, find focus and uh, DIY themes and all that. Are you in any mastermind groups or have you participated in anything like that? Uh, it's been a long time, probably like 2011 since okay. I've done that. I did one local group here in Austin. Um, I am not much of a group guy or a team guy. Okay. I am a team guy if I'm on a team like sports and stuff. Yeah. I like that. I like figuring out ways to help the team win. <laughs> but uh, I try to think what my, my – I just have a little bit of a distaste for stuff like that because I feel like there's concepts and we try to thrust these concepts onto others when the reality is you just need to understand that a concept exists, chew on it, and see how that fits into your – ecosystem in your scenario and so i feel like a lot of those discussions and mastermind groups kind of kind of devolve into like a best practices sort of thing and i just uh, you know i just i don't know i don't know i think i think things require so much deeper thought and like you know like you can't really cover what it is for you in a mastermind session it's just like a concept comes up and i feel like we could have a concept come up in one sentence and i could run with that and work on this for a month you know what i mean right so on that basis, and then on the same, by the same token, I don't like because uh, it's very easy to see things in a concrete way when we have walked a path, but it's not concrete for others. There isn't like one to one correspondence, and I think I struggle with that too because, like I said, I'm such a systematic thinker, and knowing that there's idiosyncratic differences, I'm just not comfortable with those discussions, and they feel kind of counterproductive to me in the end. Well, it's good to have. I mean, you're a contrarian, it sounds like, but um, I, I just, suppose that's true. <laughs> yeah. But that's okay because it seems to work for you. But I was going to say everyone, you know, loves masterminds or at least the people that are talking about it. Oh, totally. Totally. I mean, they're popular for sure. Selection bias there. All right, Chris, where can people find you? Where would you like them to connect? All right. Uh, if you want, if you want to connect with me, the person, my Twitter feed is honestly the best place to do that. I hate that. I hate that it's quarantine over there. Everything should exist on websites. I'm all about the freedom thing and owning your own stuff. But unfortunately, Twitter is the least 
you know, it's the most frictionless medium for this. If you really kind of want to tap into all things me and all the stuff I'm talking and thinking about, uh, that's the most interesting place to connect with me. It's at Pearsonified, uh, which I'm sure we can yep. put that on some notes on this thing at some point. Uh, another place, my business website with all my products, DIY themes, uh, DIY themes.com, D I Y people transpose those letters for some reason, DIY themes.com. And then my personal website, pearsonified.com, which is going to be getting some, some updates here soon. But, um, those are the main places. Also I have G uh, golden ratio typography stuff is now housed at grtcalculator.com. And the point of the GRT calculator is to enable you if you're not using my software, which is a grave sin not to be using my software. But if you are not and you want to see what your environment might look like if it were enhanced with golden ratio typography, you can go to that site and uh, get the nitty gritty details on that. You can input your information. It will spit out what you know your content might look like if it were better formatted uh, with this, this, uh, golden ratio typography system. Very good. I'll put links for everything so people don't have to write it down. And Chris, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks a lot for joining me. Well, thanks for reaching out and doing this. It's fun. Uh, I haven't done something like this in a long time. So this is, this is great. Thanks again to Chris from DIY themes. Please do check out Chris's stuff. Um, if you want to interact with them directly, like he said, he's on Twitter and he's uh, fairly accessible. I mean, I just emailed him, for example. Anyway, um, you can check out his stuff. You can check out the uh, typography golden ratio calculator as well and just all the stuff over at DIY Themes. Now, if you're new to the channel, welcome. I'm glad you checked out this video. I encourage you to check out some of the other videos. Most of the time I talk about um, affiliate marketing, Amazon affiliate marketing and keyword research, that sort of thing. But I go all over the place. So sometimes there's uh, digital nomad type information. There's productivity and project management. I'm a PMP. Uh, that's a project management professional. And um, sometimes I put videos of my dog on there too, on here on here on YouTube. So anyway, thanks again for checking it out. And uh, thanks again, Chris. We'll catch you next time.